Oh, what a wonderful film. Every time I watch that. Yeah, another round of applause. Seriously. <laughs> I am smiling throughout that entire film. It's such an amazing way to talk about a problem, a global problem that can feel extremely overwhelming. And yet, looking at the action that these students are taking, it's so inspiring. And I just, I can't help but smile and just feel very hopeful. Um, so I'd like to invite our panelists up. Um, feel free to come take a seat. Um, so today on our amazing panel, we have um, Debbie Lee Cohen on our far right. Um, Debbie is the co-director and producer of Microplastic Madness. Um, is, and she is also the cafeteria culture executive director and founder. Uh, she's also a multidisciplinary artist, educator, and zero waste activist. Um, second to the right, we have uh, Sandra Goldmark. Sandra is a teacher, designer, and entrepreneur who focuses on innovative and sustainable engagement with material culture. She is an associate professor of professional practice in the Department of Theater at Barnard College, and she also serves as Barnard's first director of campus sustainability and climate action. Uh, next, we have doc Dr. Joachim Goes. Um, so Dr. Joachim is a Lamont research professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. His research focuses on understanding how ocean ecosystems in plankton are responding to climate change. Um, he's also a member of the Prevention of Plastic Pollution Consortium at Columbia and he mentors undergraduates, graduates, and postdoctoral students in both his laboratory at Columbia and at sea, and much of his research focuses on microplastics. <laughs> and finally, we have Rhonda Kessler, who is the Education Director at Cafeteria Culture. She's been with the organization since 2016 and has led a variety of programs for students in all grade levels, from pre-K to university, as well as for educator trainings, including plastic-free waters, Socratic discussions, Gar Garbology 101, and more. <laughs> and I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Laurel Zaima Sheehy. Um, I'm the program manager of the non-degree programs at Columbia University. So we um, focus on different educational initiatives for students, K through 12, um, educators, and professional learners as well. And in my time in education, I've done quite a bit of work on microplastic research with students. So I'm thrilled to be moderating today. <laughs> So first, I just want to ask everyone on the panel, um, what is your interest in microplastics and, and how did you become involved in this work? Uh, well, I can say um, that when I've always been concerned about too much trash, like probably everybody here. And um, uh, when I was a mom, I would volunteer in my daughter's elementary school cafeteria and I had to pretend that everything existed from here up because of all the trash going into one garbage can. And um, so I started a sorting program at the school, but then I discovered very quickly Debbie Lee's work with styrofoam out of schools at the time. And um, I uh, became a fan quite quickly and um, hounded her until she um, allowed me to work with them. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, was on a cruise, um, and we were sailing around the Korean Peninsula, and um, in, I had this automated machine that takes images of uh, particles in the water, and we started seeing these round beads, which we didn't know what they were, and I thought they were bubbles in the, in the flow system. Um, and it was very fortuitous that um, a friend of mine who was working on looking at these particles um, on a filter, he accidentally uh, put his um, samples in an oven, um, and it was supposed to be in degrees centigrade. He thought it was Fahrenheit, and he got the temperatures mixed up, and we started getting the smell of uh, some electrical wires burning. And then we realized that these um, beads that I was seeing were actually plastic beads. 
And I brought all the data home and I got someone from Barnard actually to start looking at this data. And we backtraced this to uh, the cosmetic industry in Korea. Um, and it was also the shipbuilding yards that used um, plastic beads in, as aerosol uh, for the paints. So that got me interested and I started uh, digging deep into this. And my initial work was mostly with high school students. And that's why this movie touched me so much. And I hope I can continue um, having students in my, in my lab because they are an inspiration in a big way to me. When, when was that? Uh, this was in 2016. And I think we met at a fashion, a sustainable fashion uh, be, yeah. meeting. And uh, I got in touch with a fashion designer over there and she said that you know, she would like to work with me. And so we got interested in fabrics. Um, and so she got me about 120 different samples from all over the world, from different companies. And I had high school students work with the samples. And one of the most interesting things we found out is uh, today they showed about this uh, clothes sharing plastic, mi microplastic fibers. But one of the most outstanding research uh, that came out from that work was that, you know, the, even the uh, soap that we use contains a lot of plastics. So um, uh, that was very interesting to me that, you know, they were able to find that. And we found out that um, even the dishwater washing soap that we use contains a lot of uh, plastics and it's used as abrasives and uh, that was very interesting as well so my uh, entry point i guess to plastics is uh, a little different although i think we might hear this entry point twice tonight i was uh, i was a theatrical set and costume designer for many years so i made scenery and costumes and when you work as a designer really in any industry whether it's fashion or theater you make a lot of stuff and therefore you make a lot of waste. So at a certain point, I felt that I had just personally filled so many dumpsters with scenery or costumes that I just couldn't do it anymore. And I, and I, this was 2010 or 11, and I just had this big moment of I can't do this anymore. And I started changing the way I designed, and I started also um, reading and researching a lot about consumption, the way we make things. And it's like, you know, it's like a sweater. You pull on one thread of any of these objects in the world today and you become connected to the entire world very quickly. And um, so I'm not an expert within that world of consumption and circularity, which I became very interested in. I'm not an expert on plastics particularly, but it is such a pernicious and wicked and ever-present part of the larger landscape of how we design and manufacture and use almost everything that we make today. So that's that was my entry point. So I also come from a theater background and I mixed plastics, you know, where we'd have compounds. We used to go down to Canal Street, you know, and literally buy these chemicals that we would mix that, you know, only 20 years later, we I can remember even calling Dow Chemical and asking, you know, did they know were these carcinogens, were they dangerous? And they say, no, it's fine, you know, everything's fine. And of course, so now in retrospect, knowing what these corporations knew when we use these chemicals often in closed spaces. And, um, but, uh, but the question you asked, Laura, was about microplastics, which nobody's, well, I've had many Q and A's and nobody's asked that question before, specifically about microplastics. And for me, the first moment was actually in Arizona, in Hopi land, um, when my children were really small. It was like 2004 or five, and I was at a Hopi dance. It was an incredible experience. It could have been yesterday or 500 years ago. And my kids started playing in the sand. There were people actually selling food. And I looked at this house and I thought, oh, these people have probably been selling food at this house for hundreds of years, at the dances every summer. And in the sand, were hundreds or thousands of pe little pieces of styrofoam cups from years of the food being served in that spot. And at that particular moment of all places in the desert, <laughs> not by the ocean, not in the city, I think that was the first time that I ever even thought about, we didn't have that term microplastics at that time, but it was the first time I thought about what happens to plastics in that form and how long those plastic pieces would be there. And that was a really shocking moment for me. 
Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I, I think I had a very similar kind of shocking experience in my exposure to the microplastic work. I was, um, so before my role at the Columbia Climate School, I worked at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory with the Polar Geophysics Group. And we were in a group meeting talking about um, how carbon can be transferred um, atmospherically. And I don't, to me, perhaps it's my marine science background, but I had just asked if they had ever tested the snow falling in some of the most remote areas of the world for plastic pollution. And this group had not even considered it. So that kind of sparked our interest in collecting, working with the group in Aspen, collecting snow samples, um, working with Joachim and his lab and analyzing it. And we found just a staggering amount of plastics in snow samples in very remote areas of Aspen. And then more papers have started to come out about, you know, plastic being littered in Antarctica, in the Arctic. It's, it's um, shocking how it can be just everywhere ubiquitous on our earth um so it was kind of that shocking moment as well that really like brought me into this world um and into this work um i also want to invite everyone who has a question feel free to come up to either microphone we'd love to hear any questions that you have throughout this panel um so my next question is kind of uh directed more toward debbie and rhonda um what do optimistic media pieces, such as this film, um, do for educating the general public and about environmental pollution challenges? And, and why do you think this positive take is just so important? Okay, well, I think that there are so many climate movies out there now that are important in educating us about the problems, the extent of the problems, and um, the desperate need to make a change, a systemic change. But um, it can be such a drag and such a, such, so difficult to watch. And actually the information that's contained in them itself can be a deterrent when actually that's what we all need to hear. But just like when we teach our students the real realities about the climate problem, the plastic pollution crisis, we don't tell them anything without an action, without giving them an opportunity for action. And that action is an antidote for climate grief, for climate anxiety, for us, and for an audience as well, but also for our students. And that's the most important part because we need them to not give up hope. <laughs> so making that kind of systemic change is really important and having our kids who live on the front lines of the climate crisis, having them making that change. These are kids for whom the system isn't always kind, but they're actually affecting the system. They're talking to decision makers like incredible Stephen O'Brien, who's here with us tonight from, from School Food, and you know city council members and their principals and making requests that they never thought they would make and going into a room that is so formal and bringing their you know, grounded, you know, grounding exercises. Debbie Lee, do you want to add anything to that? Just that when we were, you know, we, we didn't plan to make this movie, first of all. And I think that's the first thing to think about. When often you think about documentaries and you see a lot of documentaries, you think, you know, people spend a lot of years. They plan, they storyboard, they try to fundraise, they pitch it to somebody. The movie came to us. And it came to us through these beautiful voices of these students. And when we walked into the school, when we walked into PS15, we were thinking we'd make some you know, YouTube video. We weren't thinking we'd make a feature documentary. But the students clearly made it clear to us that their story needed to be told, and they had a story to tell. And so within the storytelling part of it, yeah, you know, then there's the point where you, you, you film for a year and then you have post-production, right? And you have a lot of choices. There's a lot of footage that's not in there that I wish I could show everybody. <laughs> I wish we had money and time to edit it and it's so beautiful. Um, but the students themselves, they made the calls. Their energy was in the footage. It wasn't like we, we decided, oh, we're gonna make an upbeat movie. We did decide, that we weren't going to make a documentary unless there was a take action ending. And that was something both Atsuko and I felt very strongly about having worked in the documentary world. There was no way I wanted to sit through watching this movie a hundred times and people say, what should we do? We wanted our audience to watch the movie and say, I know exactly what I want to do. 
So did any of you have a feeling today that you had, when you watched the movie, that you had an idea that you want to take an action? There's a couple of students here from Jersey City, from sixth and seventh grade, sorry to embarrass you, but you're also amazing. They're doing amazing work already, studying microplastics in sixth and seventh grade. Um, you know, and it's, so I'm curious to know, maybe you'll talk a little bit later, but it was really the students that set the tone for this movie. And we were so lucky to have them as our partners in making the movie. That's a, that's a real honor. Oh, and that energy was so apparent. You could you could feel it throughout every step of this movie. And the take action and solutions at the end are incredibly inspiring. And I do want to give a little shout out that tomorrow is our 2022 Plastic Free Lunch Day. So I would love for you to share a little bit more about your visions for this year for that event. So here's Mr. Stephen O'Brien, who is in the movie, and I'm sure Stephen would like to say something so about this also, because none of this would have happened without Stephen as our partner. But what's amazing is what came out of this movie was in 2019, we were on a panel with Stephen at Cooper Union, and some of the students who were in the movie, Rebecca, who was supposed to be here tonight, I'm so sorry that she's sick. She called me so sadly this morning to tell me that. And, um, at the end, during that panel, the students said to Stephen, they said, well, we, we need to do a citywide plastic free lunch day. And Stephen, I'm not exactly sure what you said, but you said, well, maybe five years. And the students said, no, 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 no. It can't, we cannot wait that long. And that's the great thing about having students as advocates because time, you have a different sense of time than most adults. And that's so important and that's so valuable. And, um, a few months later, Stephen came back and he said, we're going to make this happen. And he said, I think we can do it in May 2020. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. And that was that, you know, we, we had to wait. But Stephen, why don't you give the mic to Stephen and give him a chance to say what happened. First of all, thanks for coming out today to listen to the story and to have such great narratives as to why this all is so important. Um, it's not us in the room that we have to convince, it's everyone around us, our families, our communities. Um, and really what you're hearing is the students are the ones that I work for. I'm a public servant. My role is to serve the students. And the students are the ones that asked for all of these changes um, from re removing the polystyrene plates to going to compostable utensils to thinking about microplastics and the way we're packaging our food, which is the next big horizon. Um, all of those policy decisions that, yes, I get to sit in an executive conference table and I can champion and be the voice for our students when those decisions need to be made, um, but it's all coming from the students. And I would just say that when you think about Plastic Free Lunch Day, um, or you think about what we're going to do tomorrow, which is Plastic Free Lunch Day USA, it's going across the whole country, um, this is going to take quite a while for us to dismantle the heavy reliance on plastics in all industries, not just food. Um, but we need to be conscious of it before we can start to make a change. And I just say that the youngest generation, the students are the ones that are going to make this happen, you know, are going to think about natural textiles instead of um, plastic textiles, are going to think about how we're going to use more reusable products and not rely on plastics when it comes to the medical industry, when it comes to syringes, when it comes to the way we think about our food systems. Everything that we've become so reliant on now needs to be rethought. So there's a tremendous opportunity, but it can be daunting, but I do love the movie for the fact that it shows solutions and each of these solutions I think can be worked out. We just need people to listen and to start making the changes. So when you write to Mayor Stephen in Jersey City, he, that, that he's working for you, you know, that's really important. He's serving you and you, even though you don't vote yet, you are his constituents, okay? That's it, you can, I'm happy to give you advice when you get to that. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that is um, absolutely true. It, it's gonna take some time, but it starts with education and it's going to, you just feel the movement and it's coming from the students. Um, I wanna ask uh, Sandra and Joakim some questions about your work. Um, so I'm curious about 
Joakim, some of the recent findings that you have in your area in regards to microplastics, whether it be, um, as you had briefly mentioned, in um, washer soap or textiles. And Sandra, some of the work that you're doing around um, sustainability and the circular economy and how you see the plastic solution um, potentially being in this circular economy. So Joaquin, would you like to start? Yeah, uh, today after seeing the movie, um, so I've been working with high school students for about three or four years now, and you know, and I was trying the same thing out, and uh, we used to come to a dead end, they used to go to school, try to influence their teachers and their principal and uh, the school managers, but they could never get past this problem of stopping uh, banning plastics in school. And today when I saw this movie, I said, oh my God, I should have been working with elementary or fifth graders. <laughs> yeah. But I can understand the situation that they were in. Uh, you know, they wanted to graduate, they wanted to do well in school, and they had no time to pursue this. But there was so much that came out from that little experience that I had is that um, one of the students actually came and worked with us that summer. And she was on a field trip in a tidal marsh, and she came back to me and said, I, I think I found a solution for the straws that we use in school. And there was an invasive species, uh, it's a reed, um, it's called the Phragmites, and she said that we could use that to make uh, straws. And um, she went to the school and told the teachers about it, and I am not sure how Forbes magazine got word of her idea and she was interviewed by Forbes <laughs> magazine and she was given an award and she landed up in uh, Williams and she's studying there now but um, you know these little things make a big difference and that's why this movie uh, was so inspirational but uh, currently um, we are going beyond microplastics uh, we are looking at nanoplastics so every time you dip your tea bag in uh, in hot water uh, there are millions of nanoplastics that come out. And the sad thing is that this get into your bloodstream very easily. And especially for expecting mothers, this is not a good thing. And it's very difficult to talk about this right now because we are not sure what are the impacts. Um, but we do know that every time you dip your bag into that hot water, it creates a lot of problems. The other thing that we have found out recently, and this is working with a high school teacher, is that um, all these um, microplastic fibers that are in our waterways, they absorb a lot of pharmaceuticals. And one of the interesting findings from that was that all the fibers from around Newtown Creek and close to Wall Street where we were sampling were full of this uh, hypertension medicine called ethanol. Um, and you can see the reason why is that because these people are under high pressure, you know, they're high pressure jobs and so they use a lot of this blood pressure medication, but elsewhere it was, um, you know, ibuprofen, painkillers, or maybe, um, you know, antibiotics. But all this work is coming from high school students that we do in our lab. I, I don't have um, the bandwidth to work with plastics myself, so I get all my work done. Uh, one of the best projects that came out of um, the work with the high school students was that um, I asked them to get shrimp from different countries all over the world, and uh, which they get in their grocery stores. And they found out that farmed shrimp was full of plastics. And we started, I asked them to research about it, and they found out that the pellets that they use for feeding this shrimp, actually uh, they put the plastics deliberately because they want to keep the feed afloat so that it doesn't sink to the bottom and suck out the oxygen. So um, that was an interesting finding that came out from the students. So things like this, you know, uh, enrich not only us, uh, them, but they enrich us as well. So I find it really interesting. And plastics is a really good medium to, uh, to talk about um, how our environment is changing based on our use of, uh, you know, plastics. Wow. Um, is any of this research driven by the students, is it published? Yes, some of it is published. Uh, some of them have been written up in newsletters. Uh, but there's an entire program that we have now with the Columbia School of um, CSD, Sustainable Development. And we have what is called an Eco Ambassadors Program. And these are like little students who come and do projects with us and um, they take their message home. 
Um, and right now we have got uh, uh, into partnership with one of these GIS um, software companies where they can make story book maps. And so um, that is helping spread the word around informally, but not as, as to an extent that your movie will do. Yeah. The research findings are um, shocking and disheartening, but the fact that students in high school have the opportunity to be a part of scientific research and get published is a fantastic pathway for them in STEM. So it is wonderful that you work so closely with students um, in this field. And Sandra, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share about your work in sustainability and circular economy. Um, do you see the plastic world involved, like could a solution of our plastic challenge be in the circular economy? I think definitely. So one of the reasons I'm drawn to circularity, remember my little moment I described of kind of cognitive dissonance in my own career, creating all this trash. I also at that time started reading and thinking a lot about um, some, finding literature on the circular economy, especially cradle to cradle, and thinking that it provides a lens, a framework, because it's it's everything, it's everywhere. Like the, the problems are so big and so interconnected and so overwhelming that sometimes you just start to think, oh my God, it's just impossible. And for me, at least, circularity provides a way to begin to understand on a very big level what the challenge is and where the problems are, and then how you can hopefully shift and apply that. So I'll give you the, ex the example. I was just rereading um, from Cradle to Cradle last night, actually. There's a great little section in it. Cradle to Cradle, for those of you who don't know, is a kind of foundational book of the circular economy, and it's um, beautifully written about how we use materials, understand materials, make them into things, and then ideally use them again. And it talks about our whole solar system, <laughs> to zoom way out from the shrimp, shrimp nanoparticles. But that's what's so beautiful about it, is it's, it, it's something that when you're looking on the tiny scale and the big scale still makes sense. Um, talking about basically two inputs, two things in our whole solar system, energy and matter, right? And it's a closed system. The energy is not going in or out, and the matter is not going in and out, except for the occasional meteorite, he says in the book. And I think, and heat loss. And so if you starting from that, to shift your whole thinking and say, every single thing around us is here to stay and is here forever and ever and ever and is never going away. It can be a way, at least for me, to instead of feeling overwhelmed, to be like, all right, that's the starting point for how we think about all of this. And while that may, may sound really kind of too big, we're trying, for example, at Barnard College to put it into practice. Now, we are far, far, far from there, but we are using circularity, and we have this framework called Circular Campus, where we're trying to think about our service items in the, in the dining hall, our waste streams, the way we handle our grounds, our purchasing, our systems and our potential for reuse just between people, all of those material flows on campus and how rethinking those material flows and understanding even our campus as a little closed system can not just reduce waste, but also help provide access to our students to affordable course supplies, right? If we can understand and understand the value of all those materials in the system and get them to where they're needed, i.e. to the students, there's a kind of beauty and a synergy whereby look, solving one problem of waste, um, you're also looking at another one in terms of um, students need affordable supplies. And I was thinking during the movie, I know this is a huge challenge, we're dealing with it at Barnard, but like, as we begin to think about reusables, right? Um, compostable items are great, they're better than styrofoam, but we all know they're also single use and they're high energy and it's a big challenge. And believe me, we have this same problem at Barnard and we're all in, this, in the same mess. As we begin to think about things like reusables, we also begin to realize that we need to pay people to wash these items. That's the problem. Why are we not using reusable service items? Is because we've built a system where we don't wanna pay. We don't want to pay for human beings to wash things anymore and we've devalued those jobs 
And so you start to say, wait a minute, maybe we need to pay for this. Maybe we need to pay for people to wash these reusable items and to remake these garments. And so for some reason, for me going and saying, okay, this system is closed, nothing's going away. There's this cascading effect where you begin to change kind of everything about the way you see so many of the decisions we make, all the way down to the little shrimp guts. And, and I don't know if that's at all useful, it's too big and crazy, but that's the only way that I can begin to try to take action, even in a little place like Barnard College or the climate school. Oh, no, I think that is a perfect explanation of how of how it can be attainable as well. So do you find on Barnard College, um, the students similar to the movie, are they generating the energy and excitement around this circular campus? Yes, I wish Delaney Michelson was here tonight. She's one of our sort of prime movers and shakers. And um, so many students over the years have um, pushed and made their voices heard and spoken up and emailed when they see things that they want changed. And I, all I can say is it makes such a huge difference. Like I'm sure that Stephen can relate to this. Like when you're in the kind of bureaucratic machine, everybody, um, you know, there's so much inertia in the system. A lot of people want to make change, but it's a, I think you said we have to dismantle a big system of reliance and that is what it is. And, and believe it or not, those student voices, that pressure does so much to help, um, to help name the priorities, to help draw attention to what's important and what students care about. Couldn't agree more. Um, we do have a question from our virtual panel. Um, from Jacob Tannenbaum, a teacher in Rockland County. He's curious if anyone on the panel knows what happened to the school since the film was made. Has the work continued in some <coughs> form with the students currently at the school? <laughs> yeah. So we are still there at PS 15. We've not left. We won't let them, they wouldn't want to kick us out. It's a quite a mutual um, admiration. Um, uh, and this year we have another EPA grant that we're working on um, um, reducing plastics. That's one of the goals. And um, as the beginning of Plastic Free Lunch Day, we're continuing it. So tomorrow will be Plastic Free Lunch Day. We'll be at PS15. Um, and um, do you wanna add? I just wanna say the students that are in the movie are now in high school which is really hard to imagine. 10th grade. <laughs> and, uh, and they went through the pandemic, and there was a point where right after the movie, there was a group that were really involved in being on panels, um, continuing as part of our youth advocacy program, uh, CAPCO Youth Advocates. And then there was this giant gap and probably a lot of hardship for a lot of our students. And, um, We've been talking about ways to incentivize them to bring them back together, you know, in New York City, which might be different in some other places, you know, kids spread out. So they're not necessarily geographically close going to school, the same schools. Um, and I think what happens in middle school, which is totally understandable, they probably like every, every time I would post something on social media on Instagram, I would just think, oh my God, Maggie must be cringing. Like, Debbie, why is she putting up that picture again of me? You know, it's an age. You know, there's like a magic age in, in documentary, for instance, in filmmaking, you know, fifth grade, we have sixth and seventh graders here, so I'm careful how I say this, but in fifth grade, you know, they, there's, you're still pretty open, and in sixth and seventh grade, kids generally become a lot more self-conscious, and that's clearly what I felt, and we're hoping now that the students are a little bit older, and the pandemic is whatever it is, um, that we have this opportunity to really reconnect with them, um, some of them we think are doing some really interesting things, but they're not as involved as they were a few years ago, and it's hard to sustain that. Some people come back, you know, years later. Some people like Rebecca, who was on the, who was scheduled to be on the panel. I'm so sorry she's not here. She wasn't in the movie, but we started working with her class when she was in fifth grade. I would imagine she's one of the few students from her school who's ended up at Columbia, which is really incredible, and she walk to city hall by herself in sixth grade there was a day i was supposed to go with her and my mother was ill i went to california and suddenly i looked on my social media feed and brad lander who was our council member at that time posted a picture of 
Rebecca in sixth grade, like sitting at the table there. And I called her, I said, how did you get there? She said, I walked. She literally walked, she got permission and she literally walked from her middle school to City Hall to testify. So anyway, so it's interesting, you know, what happens over the years, you know, things, you know, different things happen in people's lives, but these students are still very dear to us. And um, it's a lot of work in the schools. Rhonda, can, Rhonda should speak on this because she's the one who does all the work, you know, trying to get media release forms, for instance. Like, you might ask yourself, why are there not more movies made in public schools? <laughs> it's very hard to get permission to make a movie in a public school. And we sort of paid our dues for years, building the trust with Department of Ed, building the trust with the media office, developing our own media program where the students actually had their own cameras. So we weren't an outside group. It, it was an integral part of what we were already doing. Um, so it will be really interesting. We really hope that we can do something where, whether it's a study, whether it's a sequel, whether it's just a short report, that we can tell you all what's happening with these students in their lives now, that this education actually have a long lasting impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. I will say this uh, education and film had a long lasting impact on all of our lives. So <laughs> that is um, a long-term benefit for sure. Uh, my last question for everyone is just if you have one takeaway from this panel, this event, this film, your work, what would you like to tell everyone that's watching today? Rhonda, we can start with you. I would just say that um, individual change is amazing. You know, packing a zero waste lunch, um, <laughs> trying to not buy potato chips, um, whatever it is. But systemic change is everything, and it's the biggest. It's a slow moving, I say this, it seems like it's um, moving like an iceberg, but it's the movement is really titanic because it makes a huge wave. And just look, we started at PS15 with Plastic Free Lunch Day in one small school, and now it's across the country in five school districts tomorrow, and it's gonna be monthly in New York City, so systemic change. Yeah. If there's one takeaway from me today personally, I think it's a hope. Um, you know, I, as I said, I worked with high school students and I'd given up hope. But today when I saw this movie, oh my God, I'm so hopeful about the future. Thank you so much for making this movie. This movie is very, very moving. I have kids, you know, fifth grade and ninth grade, so sort of, <laughs> um, I wish I'd brought my fifth grader here to see it. But I think, I guess, you know, sort of picking up on, on a little bit what Rhonda said, I think wherever you are, I think change, I think change always starts small. That systemic change actually starts with deciding you're not gonna buy those chips anymore, or then you're not, you're gonna, you don't like the trash cans in your lunch and, and, and that's how you get that titanic shift. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it, do more of it and, and speak up. I think that's the key. The difference between an individual change and a systemic change is you share and you talk about it and you, and you multiply it out. And I think that's how we get to that titanic shift. And I was going to say something similar to what Rhonda said, and that's why I thought, well, Rhonda will say it, because I had a feeling Rhonda, she'll probably say it better than me. But building on that, really what's the most important thing, and I think it's something that many of us don't think about, is really quality education for youth, so that youth have the opportunity within the school day to participate in advocacy and learning to advocate because it might be one of the most important skills that they learn for the future in their lives for this this century of this difficult century that's coming upon us or it's already here and um i just can't emphasize that enough we have this great contingency here sorry new Jer uh, jersey city group there but your voices people are listening to youth now and if you want to call it the greta theory the greta effect or whatever you want to call it it's really it's an incredible time and just like dr chelsea says in the movie i love when she said that in the interview you know like our our electeds our policymakers want to hear what you have to say more than what what we adults have to say 
And the way that you say it is also a way that they can hear it that's different than all of us. And so for you, I encourage you to use your voice. You already are, take it to the next step. I can't wait to see what you're gonna do. And for the adults in this room, to really, when you think about, we think about policy, we don't always think about education in terms of policy and the opportunities within the education and what do our students deserve in terms of quality uh, climate education and interdisciplinary climate education. You know, we tend to think, oh, it's the sciences. It's really across all disciplines. And I hope that some of that came across in the movie. And I hope to inspire some of you to also take action and speak up for that kind of policy as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our incredible panel. It has been an honor working to put on this event for you all with Cafeteria Culture, Barnard Sustainability, um, and, and thank you so much for joining us today, everyone.